Hey guys, this is Jim Collins with another episode of Journey to the Pit. I'm actually just uh, laughing at uh, our special guest tonight. Those guys are comedians. But uh, uh, well, like I said, welcome to another episode of Journey to the Pit. We got a special guest tonight, which uh, we've been advertising the last couple of days. Uh, he's uh, actually the second. Um, this is part two of his first interview of coming on Journey to the Pit. So uh, we wanted to bring him back on and have him a part of this uh, Journey to the Pit uh, interview marathon that we're running. We're trying to do 10 interviews, 10 days back to back. And hopefully by the end of these interviews, we'll, this quarantine will be lifted. Our lives will be more uh, come back closer to normal and uh, give us something to think about and talk about and conversate about, you know, something positive uh, throughout this time that we're under quarantine. A lot of us are spending a lot more time in the house. Uh, some of us is not working. Kids are out of school. So we just thought this would be a great opportunity to bring some good content uh, that we can talk about and enjoy. So um, just give me a second. I'm going to bring our special guest on, Mr. Don Lester. Like I said, it's his second time uh, coming on. And then I'll say the disclaimer once he gets on the uh, show. Um, again, just make sure you hang in there to the end of the show, and I'll let y'all guys know what's the date, to, you know, what's the plan uh, for the rest of the interviews. Um, we got eight more, eight more interviews to do. So, uh, like I said, watch the whole video more towards the middle of the end. I'll talk about, uh, when we plan on doing the next interviews, um, when you can check the dates at and all that kind of stuff. So, like I said, but as of right now, we're going to go ahead and bring in Mr. Don Lester and, uh, he'll be coming in in a second. What's up, brother? What's up, my man? I hear that, man. How you doing? I'm doing great, Jim. How about yourself? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And like I say, man, guys, uh, we got Mr. Don Lesser on tonight. Uh, many of the viewers watching know him. Some know him personally. Some don't, you know, know him through social media or at least through the game file industry. Um, but the ones that do not know him, um, you can go back and watch. Don came on. It was probably about eight months ago or something like that. Came on and did an interview. Yes, sir. It's, yeah, been, it's it was, been at least that long. Yeah. 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 It, it's been a while. So 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 Mr. Lester came in kind of when Journey to the Pit was almost on a on a ground floor. We was kind of getting this thing up off the ground. So he's one of the uh, few that came in and uh, was a part of uh, Journey to the Pit with these interviews and spread this information and be a part of this movement that we have been creating. It's actually been growing bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's a great thing. But before we get started, let me go ahead and say the disclaimer. All the information discussed in this interview is for historical, educational, entertainment purposes only. None of this information is intended for any illegal purposes, and all opinions are respected of the individual. So, Mr. Lester, I have already um, introduced you. Is the audio and video good on your end? Yes, sir. It's all good on my end, and I look as good as I can, Jim. I freshened up my best. I don't know if you're going to make it or not. <laughs> <laughs> hey, brother, well, you looking good, man. You looking good, man. And listen, I know you sitting at the table and I see you looking around. Uh, 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 you know, who, who you looking at? Who, who's there around that table, man? Tell them to peek their hands on, on in here. This, uh, here. Here's Mr. Jeff Chapman, Senior. How you doing, Jim? That's, that's right. What's up, brother? Hey, I know a lot of y'all guys watching, y'all might know uh, who Jeff Chapman is. But like I say, he's a, he's known throughout the game file industry, too. You know, he's out of Kentucky. Uh, we'll be having him on the show also, too, just to let y'all guys know. And we got one other little corporate sitting in the back. Hi. Hang on. Hang on. Here comes here come Mr. James Barnes, the greatest vet tech. Oh, I know that's right. One of the smartest medical minds in the field. That's right. And, and many of y'all guys watching, y'all guys know James Barnes. If not, y'all can go on his uh, Facebook and, uh, and and reach out to him. Also with Jeff Chapman Sr. because it is a junior. So, uh, you know, you can you can reach out to both of those guys, too. But just to let y'all guys know, all three of those guys stay together. So y'all just can imagine the knowledge that's being bounced around inside that house on a day to day basis. Um, you got. Uh oh. <laughs> hey, 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 it got to be. <laughs> Hey, I, 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 I that's says, the first time we called it knowledge. That's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> we usually just go with the short word BS, but that's yeah, the yeah, knowledge word. Right. That's right. the complicated words of telling you. <laughs> hey, <laughs> even at a third grade level, we, we can follow Jim. Hey, that's right, man. But as long as y'all y'all get it done, so I don't know what level it is, but I know it's a level that's working, man. The level that is working. But listen, man. Let's go ahead and kind of get this interview started, man. And like I say, guys, every all the viewers out there watching, we're going to be bringing those other guys in. Um, but I just wanted to kind of highlight and make note that, you know, um, all those guys are from three different places. They all ended up in the same house. 
uh, all because of these animals. You know what I mean? It's just amazing how God works in mysterious ways. And I just want to kind of, you know, point that out because a lot of times that's overlooked. It has never highlighted the relationships that these game fouls have created for us and, and the impact that the positive impact that they make on our lives. I know a lot of times we highlight or not we. But the negative aspects, the very small percentage of a negative aspect of our culture is always highlighted. Um, but very few times we all, you know, we talk about and uh, at least highlight the relationships and the impact, positive impact that these animals have made on our lives. So um, I just want to kind of put that out there because I think it's really cool that all three of those guys are are, are, are staying together. They come from three different backgrounds and there's a wealth of knowledge in that house, regardless of what they call it. Um <laughs> but we're going to have a, a, a we're going to have a um, a live stream. Uh, they sit down at the breakfast table every morning, you know, all three of them before they get their day started. And I told them I wanted to do a live stream um, just to be a part of that conversation. You know, a lot of times guys say they would love to be a fly on a wall. But uh, so we're going to have journey to the pit is going to be the fly on the table. So it ain't going to be on the wall. I don't want nobody hanging a phone from the wall. OK. <laughs> it's uh well I, I can tell you this uh if we show a picture of this food that james cooked y'all all gonna be hungry so i'm just gonna tell you that right now <laughs> cook, man. i know he can man i know he can well listen mr less there's been a lot of people that's been anticipating this interview um and again a lot of them have watched part one some of them haven't and uh we kind of you know not so much pick up where we left off which i think we should do but then also talk about some other stuff too to kind of you know recap uh, some of the things that we kind of talked about in the first interview to kind of get people up to speed, um, you know, about who Don Lester is. Uh, so let's kind of start off like I usually do is kind of start off with the back history. How did you get into game foul and how old were you then? Lord, Jim, I think I was eight years old when I when I first got into game foul. And what, what I'd done, uh, a gentleman that worked for my dad, his name was Alan Bryant, would take me to the fights with him. And I would go to the dead piles and pick out the roosters that were still there and still alive. This is back when it was legal, of course. And right. I would, I would, uh, and I, my first roosters, those were my first roosters. And I kept them up a year. And I mean, I had a misfit bunch of chickens. I'm talking about they was good duck legged and one eyed and everything else. And, uh, Alan, Alan Bryant put them up. And Alan Bryant was a dear friend of mine, but bless his heart, if he fed a duck, it would drown. But, <laughs> <laughs> But he put these roosters up for me because I didn't know nothing about it. And he put them up for me. And we went to Tacoma, Georgia, and won four straight and a little four cock, me, nine years old. It was a it was a good moment. And I've been wide open ever since. Uh took some time off. I had a bad divorce and and my mom and dad passed, had cancer and passed. So that was about a ten year period there that I was out of the gang foul business, but been into other than that the whole time. Right. And I, right, and, right, I, and, right. I so and and by the way. Uh, I'm 84 years old, so I look really good for my age. No, you. <laughs> I hear that, man. <laughs> Listen, but tell me this, Don. So, so you are for you first generation, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, you know, I, I really envy these guys that's raised up. Uh, their daddy's done it, and their granddaddy's done it. Like James, his granddaddy done it, and uh, Jeff Jr. And now his kids are gonna have Jeff, and they're gonna be a third generation deal and that's I really envy that and I had my kids I really would give anything my kids were involved but I was really harsh on them I guess and, and too disciplined on them when we were raising fowl of our own and I mean I was really strict about water cups and whatnot if uh I'd have 400 roasters out there and if I had if I couldn't drink their water they had to so they got a little it just I was just a little too harsh on them I think so they don't care nothing about the gang fowl business but James has got a son called JJ and that's my little protege so We'll see how that works. Oh, that's out. good, man. That's right. Well, it's, it's amazing. Like I said, God work in mysterious ways, don't he? Amen. So you don't have your seven year old, but now you got a new seven year old. So that's that's mm -hmm. amazing. Um, so tell me, let's kind of walk us through it, man, so we can build this whole story for the viewers out there. So you're around eight years old, eight, nine years old. You know, you have a good friend. Um, he feed out. You do your first show. You go four straight at nine years old. You know, what happens after that for Mr. Lester? Well. And I'll go ahead and share the story. I shared it with you last time. Uh, I, I, I was raised by a good Christian family. And I took that little money that I had won there, and I was like, I think I won $3,200. So I can't exactly remember. I had like 320 bucks, over $300 that I owed in tithes and offerings. And I remember going to the church, and boy, some of them ladies pulled me out of that church. and Because in between 
Sunday school and church, they had about 15 men in a mission there. And some of them old ladies got me outside that church and they scolded me and told me that was the devil's money and I was in trouble and had me believing it. I was about to cry and had me thinking that I was doing the wrong thing. And right. uh, my preacher, the preacher was my uncle, got up and he said, we have a guest preacher this morning. And the preacher's name was uh, Mr. Lemon. He was out of Young Harris, Georgia. And he preached a message on why Christians should be more like Gamecocks. So I puffed my little chest wow. out. And I, I ain't let up since. So that's, that's the way to go. Wow. So tell me this, Don. Did the, did the, did the preacher know, you know, what Absolutely. was going on? Or Absolutely not. He had no idea. He came in He, he, he came in uh, for, just for the church service. He wasn't even there for the Sunday school service. So he had no clue. Had no clue. Wow. Ain't that amazing. That is amazing. So, so, those, so I guess you're going – well, for those of you that, and, and listen, this is an important uh, topic in itself. Uh, and I have a lot of people that through that first interview that contact me and say, hey, man, I have a, you know, my, I'm having a hard time understanding this. And is this God's will? And I can't tell you what God's will is for your life. I can't tell you that. I can tell you this. I've done it with his blessing and I've done it without his blessing. Because if I make it before my family or before my or before God, then it's a sin. I'm not going to be successful. Right. I'm in trouble. Right. But if I can give it its proper place, then I think God enjoys us having fun. And who he created this game file. You know, there's a lot of times I get on my knees and, and I ask him when I can't figure a roaster out. And I say, God, you made him. Tell him what's going on. He's your creature. <laughs> I'm lost, you know. So and, and oftentimes he answers. So it's, uh, that's, that's important to know uh, where people vilify us as being evil and that kind of thing. God don't. Right. So. That's right. That that's that's a powerful statement right there. And like you say, you know, when you get lost and you don't have no problem admitting when you lost, you know, you don't know what's going on. So you got to exactly. seek some help to figure it out, huh? If you feed roosters on, you're gonna know what lost feels like. <laughs> I promise, right. I promise right. you. <laughs> Even now today. <laughs> there's one roaster, right. there's one roaster we took to a poultry show this year, and uh right. I'm still lost. <laughs> <laughs> You still lost, huh? Don't know what, what, what was going on with him. Huh? Yeah, I had one that I didn't think that I thought should have been blue ribbons every time we pulled him out. And uh nope. And then I had one that uh when we when when we put it to, took him to the poultry show, we offered to trade roosters with the other boy. And uh he was spectacular. So, so there you go. Wow. <laughs> So you slipped up on both of those, huh? Yeah, I missed. Well, I missed them. By, well, I, I, I slipped up on a good way on the one, but really bad way on the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> but they well, will listen, keep I, you guessing. They will keep you guessing. They will keep. And that's the biggest challenge, man. That's the biggest challenge. It doesn't matter how long you've been into it, man. I tell you, sometimes those those birds will throw you a curveball. And, no and, you know, they, they, they react the way you think they should react and then you start pulling all the tricks out your hat and you still can't get them to where they need to be and that's that feeling of being lost like well, i don't I've know never, what's going on like none of this is making any sense i've never been more confident in one roaster and more unconfident in another one in the same show and totally different results <laughs> so there you go jeff totally can back up on that <laughs> Totally different results, huh? Probably different results. One was excellent. One was poor guy. That, poor, the poor guy on the other road. He said, man, y'all just laugh. Y'all just trying to make a fool out of me or something. No, we really didn't think you're no good, bro. <laughs> right. He was excellent. Just they know, huh? That's right. Well, tell me this, Don. So you're going on through there. You know, the first friend of yours started to feed your roosters out. You know, obviously, you still a kid at that time. Kind of walk us through, you know, when you started to – you know, start to gain knowledge of who did well, you kind of work up under at the beginning? Oh, Lord. There were so many good people, man. Uh, Raymond Arnold, who's uh, you can find him on Facebook. He has all my brood fowl right now. Uh, when I started feeding roosters for everybody else, I always trusted Raymond to keep my brood chickens. He's got them now. Uh, he is a good friend of mine, a heck of a rooster man, and he's loyal. And I really, I really appreciate him. But there were about 20 or 30 of us in that one county that fought roosters, and we would fight every two weeks at different places in the county. Well, mm -hmm. none of us fought in big derbies. And just finally when RJ and Woodside, we finally got big enough to go to Woodside, mm -hmm. big enough to go to RJ and those type things. So we started going there. 
but it was a uh, but I was up under Eddie Arnold, a lot of them Arnold boys, George Arnold, Eddie Arnold, uh, Raymond Arnold. I call him Ping Pong. Um, mm-hmm. I could go on. There's a there's a plethora of them. One, a guy named Bobby Arnold, whose daughter fed for him, and you could not whip him when his daughter fed for him. And now wow. her name's Denise, and now I've sort of made contact with her again, and she's wanting to get back in the game about me. So that's a good thing. Uh, she's a nurse. But it's a uh, so so these these game foul will tie you up with friends that you never would have met otherwise. Well, right. me and you, Jim, me and you, Jim, we never would have met without That's game right. five. Uh, me and Jeremy Daniels, who you set me up with, never would have met had it not been right. for game five. So we had, we, I have some great relationships. But I went from there to competing on a small level there. I even run a pit when I was like 10, 11 years old. Uh, I made a little pit out there in the woods beside our house, and that was one of the places that we'd fight. It was a uh, so, so I've been involved in it in a long time. But now when I got about 15, 14, 15 years old, Jack Ogle got me to raise, got me to compete for him, go up there and feed for him. And he, he told me he was a farmer who was, who was failing miserably. It was a time when uh, farming was really going downhill. His kids were on food stamps. He was on welfare. They were selling the farm off piece by piece. And he was raising chickens for Billy Abbott. Well, okay. he was just raising them up till they were stags, and then Billy would come get them. Well, Billy passed away. Well, when Billy passed away, didn't nobody come get them. He wanted me to feed them for him. So I went over there to feed them, and boy, they was in dusty pens, and two year old roosters ain't never been handled. And we didn't do too good that first year. We won about 50%. Next year, we won about 165. But the year after that, we won about 85, 86%, and won $210,000. Which was which was a lot of money. It was a lot of money back in that day. Now he took his one, the two brothers were together, Charles and Jack Ogle and me. And Charles Jack took his. Now after we won that big, after we done that good that year, we won twenty eight straight derby fights before we lost one. But after we done so good that year, Jack took his money and put it in a um, trash truck. There wasn't no trash trucks in Old Fort County at the time. Now he's got ten. He's a multimillionaire. He was smartest of all of us. I thought he was crazy. But so I continued to fight on after that. And it's just been an ongoing process. I've ended up fighting at Yellow Leaf and I've been to Oklahoma out at Mid America. And so I've been able to travel to some good places and fight a lot of spots. Now I'm making my home in Kentucky. So, and I really like Kentucky. Right. Right. So, so tell me this, Don. So as you was going through and that was kind of your first, first, um, you know, I don't know if you want to call it a job or if you call it a job, but that was your first uh, person you start feeding with. You know, prior to that, man, like how much knowledge did you bring to the table at that time? You know what I mean? At that time, he, he had you start feeding for him. Did you well, really know what you was doing? Well, uh, yeah, and there was a lot of trial and error. <laughs> but but what, one of the best things that happened to me, and you got to understand, I went to a lot of different cocker schools. And I ordered a lot of different keeps. And my daddy was very, my, my daddy didn't fire chickens. My daddy was a race car driver. And he told me, he said, son, what are you, what are you, what's you passionate about? And I told him about roasting. He didn't care nothing about roasting. But he wanted me to be good at what I did. He said, well, who do you know is the smartest at what you're doing? And I said, well, go through the game cop. They got these schools. And, you know, used to, you could advertise cop fight schools. So he'd send me to them. He'd pay for them, send me to them. So he uh he really helped me. I can really say that my dad helped me a lot. And then uh wow. So but now Buck Hawes, who's a, who's an old rooster man, old Cherokee Indian, had a keep for a hundred bucks. When he sent me his keep, he told me how they said, I want you to mix your feed this way, and I want you to feed it to your chicken year round." And I told him, I said, Mister Mister Buck, I can't afford to feed this feed. He said, "Son, you can't afford not to." And that was the beginning of the blue bonnet meals and the blue bonnet feet there in Ardmore, Oklahoma. So anyway, but uh, it's sort of the same feed mixture. But anyway, I started feeding that way. And I'm telling you, man, I could do so good just off cord. I mean, it was people weren't feeding a lot of mixed feed then. They were just feeding right. a lot of scrap grain, that kind of thing. So I got, got ahead of the game on the nutrition end. And that's what I try to stay ahead, Jim. My, my keep constantly evolves. Because I'm always finding something nutritionally that they need, you know, that I can give them. So it's, uh, for example, I'll give you this, and this is something that I didn't share last time because I didn't know. But I had a, I had a guy tell me, 
say, and he runs, he's a triathlete. And he told me, he said, Don, you still put on roasters? I said, yeah. He said, try red beet juice. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I'm going to tell you. He said, I didn't change anything in my training techniques, but started drinking red beet juice, and I can run 10 more miles. What? He said, it just increases my stamina, it's, you know, exponentially. And so I said, okay. So I started trying it. Now, I've been trying it a little here and a little there, and I'm trying to get the dosage right, but it's all natural right. supplement, you know. But I can recommend right. that. For sure. That red beet juice, huh? Red beet juice. It will, help. Beet. it will help you. It will help them. That's what a lot of people, they see me down at the river, and I had that all that red feed sitting out there. That feed looked pink. I've been soaking right. it in that boot juice. Everybody thought I was soaking it red. Say, oh, no, you give it way too much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so they they didn't even know what they're looking at. Don't even have the slightest idea what they're looking at. Think they looking at red cell and 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 jumping in the comment section and posting all the comments. You're doing too much. It's gonna burn them up. It's gonna make them hot Let's and all this out. kind of mess. And but they I don't even know what's even red. Thing. I would have thought the same thing, Jim. Just look at it. I thought the same thing, so I can understand. Right. So now you 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 you're adding red beet juice to your feed, huh? Yes, sir. I sure do. And it's uh, I soak my feed in it, and I try to alternate. I, I I soak a lot of feed in buttermilk. That uh, we used to get from the Amish community, but maybe since Jeff Chapman hit the horse today, we may not be have that contact anymore. <laughs> well, we, you we know might, what, Don? We we're we going to tell us. Yeah, we're <laughs> going to tell that story about you know Jeff Chapman backing into and hitting the Amish horse today when y'all was yeah. out there on the arm Amish farm. Yeah, we 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 gonna get into that story <laughs> before we get to that. I want to kind of backtrack just a little bit. You know, you said that one of the biggest things that kind of made the biggest impact was your adding, learning, getting more educated on a nutritional value. You know, right. what things to give them, understanding their diet, understanding what their body need. And you said just that change alone and just what you were feeding them, you had seen an end result difference without changing oh, yeah. anything else. Yes, Freddie Henderson. Freddie Henderson was one of the biggest restaurant fighters in the country. This, this is this is when I really knew it made a difference. Freddie came by Alan Bryant's house. I was still pulling with Alan and I had all my stags at his house. And they were, they were bull stags now. They were coming cops. But Freddie stopped by my house with five roasters that he had conditioned to go to a derby. And he wanted to, uh, he said, to close the derby, didn't fight him. He wanted to fight. So he stopped by there. We pulled five roasters off the court with him five times. He made three more trips, got 15 more roosters, and ended up getting his brood cocks, and we whooped him 19 out of 20 times. And, he was a and it was Jeff. Yes, sir, and I guarantee you, people know who Freddie Henderson was. Freddie was a good feeder and a good-time rooster man, so I knew, and that wasn't none of my doing. That was them roosters straight off the court. So, but they, I was feeding them twice a day, and I was pretty much what, what you would say, feeding them conditioning grain. They were raised on conditioning grain. So, it was, they was just an excellent. Wow. So that that right there, you, that's the proof in the pudding for you. So it don't matter right. what somebody it's tell so you, no matter what you read, you know for a hundred percent fact based on years and years of experience that your feed throughout the year made a huge difference for you. Oh, absolutely. You can't. You cannot. You cannot feed. I mean, you just cannot change something. You can't make a roaster in three weeks. It takes two years to make a roaster. <laughs> and uh, we was old saying in the chicken fight world, you make can't make chicken, you can't make chicken crap. I, I mean, you can't make chicken salad out of chicken crap. It don't matter whose recipe you use. That's true. Right. That's true. Now, right. if you get a roaster that's that's not quite as healthy, and you treat him good, and you bring him up, he's gonna give you. He's gonna he's gonna do good for you. But right. and do his best that he can. But you'll never replace what he missed. And James is really big. And James, I'm, I'm learning a lot from James. Sit with James is like sitting with an encyclopedia up here in the mornings. And he's teaching me a lot about the development of a stag from the time he's zero till he's three months old. And okay. what to do to increase their lung capacity and all that. And I won't get into that because that's James's deal. Right. And I don't even have understanding. But he does, so I let him do it. <laughs> so that's, right. Right. That's, that's right. That's right. That's important. So, so tell me this, Don, you know, like with the, with the beet juice, is it something you use every day, every other day you rotate it out or how you use it? Well, Jim, I'm trying it in a couple different ways and I'm still researching with it to find out what works best. You know what I mean? 
That's I, I right. like to use yeah. it. I, I, I like to keep my feet in that boat. But now I use a lot of fruit juice when the hotter the weather gets. Anyway, you know what I mean. I'll go to soak okay. my feet in the fruit juice instead of buttermilk. I find that the hotter the weather gets, the buttermilk soil goes against you. But and okay. so I try to start using fruit juice. So I've been trying to alternate. But see, we have we've been sort of behind the barrel because uh, we ain't never hit our target date yet. You know right. what I mean? We never so much hit our target date. Things just didn't exactly go through right. So I'm still experimenting with it. Let's put it that way. It's been an experimental phase, but I do like it. I do like it. You do like it so far. What's it? So that's great. Yeah. And, and the reason why, and like I said, I, I do kind of want to spend some time on this because I think it makes a big, big difference. And I know, you know, sometimes this topic could be all over the place and everybody got their own opinions and all that. But what I like to do is talk about it when some people have actually experienced it. Not something that they read, not something that they right. told, that they were told, not something that they mentor did and it worked out right. Kind of wanted to just make sure that it's something that you've seen for yourself and, and you. So tell me this, Don. So back when, before, you know, he came in and started kind of educating you on that new feed, what were you feeding prior to that? I was just feeding scratch grain and laying pellet mix pretty much, and that's pretty much what everybody was feeding. They would get a three- or five-way scratch feed and mix laying pellet with it, and that's pretty much what people fed. And then I'll tell you the feed for that keep. It was one part joy dog food, one part uh, 16 percent laying pellet, one part racing pigeon feed, one part calf manna, and one part whole corn. In the summertime, it changed from the whole corn to oats. But now that was his feed. And that was a very expensive feed compared to my scratch feed. So it's a, uh, but it was a whole different another rooster when you raised one on it too. It really was. It, it made an amazing difference. It, it made an amazing difference. And you fed that all year long, huh? You're right out everything. Hens, stags, chicks, they was raised on it. But now, see, you don't have that advantage now because there's a lot of good feed out there now. That's right. You know I mean? That's right. If you raising your chickens on scratch feed and laying pellet, you probably ain't seen the winter circle in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You. Right. So, you know, there's yeah. just so many good feeds out here now that I really don't think you can get advantage on good feed. Yet. The only advantage a man got now is that he better have an advantage with good water, you know? And uh that's 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 and, and then learn how to be a good feeder, which I'm still trying to do. Well, you know, you have fed for a lot of people, Don, and we're going to get into that. You know, you, you, you're going to get into that. And, I, and I'm assuming, you know, we also going to talk about, too, we all know birds don't react the same way. And I guess you can't feed them all the same way. No, so so that's kind of right. So that's kind of something I also want to talk about, too. So I, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of stepping through this because I know a lot of people watching. They're already asking questions. One of the questions that they have is what kind of fruit juice you use. I'm going to put that up on the screen right here. And it says, well, uh. Well, let's discuss that, Jim, because I'm telling you, for example, uh, I may use three different kinds of fruit juices for one show. And the reason being, suppose you got a fat rooster. Uh, if you got a fat rooster, you can take that, you can take red grapefruit juice and pull that fat off of them. You take tomato juice and pull it off of it. And so now the difference between the tomato juice and the red grapefruit juice, tomato juice usually has a lot of salt in it. Okay. And the red grapefruit juice won't. You just got to make sure you get 100% juice all the time. You can use pineapple juice at 100%. Do the same thing. It's uh, any kind of acidic something will help pull that fat off. Okay. In Puerto now, Rico, I we use, use grapefruit. Yeah, yeah. Now, I've been saying now, if they're if they're perfect and not bad, I use grape juice or apple juice. It's a. Uh, um, I just find that they, they seem to. There's something about the buttermilk that seems to make them run hot. Now, I don't know okay. the science. I don't know the science behind that. And, uh, and like I say, it just only happens around May, June. You know, I'm going to switch from the buttermilk to the fruit juice. It's, uh, I think it's and the there's, a way, yeah, there's a way to cycle roasters on juice, too. And I'm working on okay. that, too. So. Okay. Okay. So so tell me this, Don. So after you change your feet, you were still working with the same guy. That was the guy, say his name again, who owned the farm. That was Jack Ogle. He, he 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 gave me my opportunity, and look, he went from he went from having his kids in a house that you, that you could see through the walls and feed the chickens through the floor to a hundred thousand dollar home in about five years. Now, one year uh, we, for three years we weren't that good. Well, about the third year is when we done good. 
first couple of years, we were 50% winners at best. And once I got that buck house keep and that buck house feed, and that really got me on, on the way. And I tell you, Mr. Hawes, I really appreciate him. He used to call me in my cock house. I was so uptown. And them old, them old farmers, they didn't have no money, but they had access to all kinds of supplies. They built me the perfect fly pins, the perfect cock house with a cement floor. I love feeding on a cement floor. It just seems like I can do better. Uh, and I guess because I you know, spent so much time on one there. Uh, my fly pins were five by five at the bottom and 12 foot tall. And had a rouge pole at six foot and one at nine and a half feet. Best pins ever fed out of. Never okay, tried now to tell me this, Don. Say that, say that again. Say that again, Don, because your voice, uh, the audio went in a little bit. So what size were the fly pins? They were five by five on the bottom. They were 12 foot tall. And it had a rouge pole at six foot, which you could remove and then put it at nine and a half feet. And when you first put them roosters in there, they could reach that six foot pole. But they could not reach that nine and a half foot pole. So when they got when they got where well, they could fly to that nine and a half foot pole and pop their wings, then you done built some muscle that you didn't have before you got there. So it was a uh, I never turned I never turned the rooster loose the fight didn't go to the other side of the pit. Got you, got you. And you never and you knew they wasn't ready if they couldn't fly to that nine and a half foot. Oh, yeah, pole. When, yeah. Well, you knew they was making progress, you know. Right. And so, but those are if I ever build fly pants again, they'll be like those. Those were the first ones I first really that those the guys told me they said, listen, come feed for us. We'll build you whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And they did. And we've done very well with them. So 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 tell me this now. What kind of what kind of bedding did you have in those fly pins? Well, I always as long as I fed, Jim, I try to change. I'll have leaves in one, straw in another one, pine shavings, I mean pine straw in another one. Uh, corn shucks and another one that way just something to keep it something different all the time and you'll find right. some roosters like this kind some roosters don't like this you know right. and so you need to have different things so, so you can find out what they like right exactly so 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 tell me this so we going through you get the new feed you get the keep you know you following a keep you said he's calling you kind of keeping you on track with the keep um what were you learning well, well, how much, how different was that keep than what you well, were already doing? All the keeps I'd ever used was uh, work him up 25 flies, work him down 25 flies. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? On him out. Two weeks ready to go. No, Mr. Hawes was four weeks and two weeks of hard work, and I mean hard work. I mean, you put it on them roasters. I, you can put this keep, you could have put Buck Hawes keep on roasters, and you can determine for you ever get there if they quit or not. Because they would make them quit wow. on the workboard. They would quit and run, put their head in the corner on that workboard. Uh, he would work them down till they could not work another fly. And people say, well, you can't cut that way. You can't cut. Let me tell you something. I want more one pit fight with his keep than I did anybody's. And because wow. he, rested them, he would rest them so long. Everybody else was resting their roasters two days back then, working them down till Wednesday and then resting them Thursday and Friday. I was resting mine for Monday. On up to right. Saturday, and uh, and they was I just done outstanding. He told me, I remember the, the first derby I fought with them roasters was a little three cop, and I had a little old kid, Jack Ogle Jr., handling for me. And he told me, he said, "Uh, I'll tell you what you do." He said, "You think?" Because I was telling him, I said, "Man, I don't think y'all work roasters this hard." So and so said, "This is wrong." The Ted Driscoll keep says this, blah blah blah. He told me, he said, "I'll tell you what you do." He said, you work them roasters. He said, what's the entry fee? I think it was 50 bucks. He said, you got two entries? He said, work them and do them exactly like I tell you. And if they don't do good for you, I'll pay you entry fee. Back to you. So I done just like you said. I won six fights in six pitches. Wow. So did. Won, the, won both entries. And whooped the toughest boys there, too. Benny Landon and Kirby. And, I mean, I whooped the toughest guys there. So, so, and see, that's amazing, man. And I know that 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 was ingrained in your mind from that point on because the proof oh, was in yeah. the pudding from there. So nobody could convince you anything different. So tell me this though. So what, what what were you doing? Now you said you were working them down, but so prior to that, you were just going through the twenty five this and twenty five that, and you know, and and, and then it kind of shifted. 
to a whole yeah. different dynamic, huh? Yeah, I went to work in roosters a whole lot harder. And I'll tell you something else that happened when I'm working them a whole lot harder. They start sparring a whole lot worse. <laughs> and I'm like, uh oh, this is going backwards. This is bad. You know what I mean? I mean, after that last week right. of hard work, right. they spar like junk. And then I, I told him, I remember getting on the phone with Buck. Was, you know, I'm a 15, 16 year old kid, and I'm getting on the phone with Buck. And I said, look, I sparred these roosters. I, I, I can't, I can't fight these chickens. I, they're terrible. They're terrible. He said, you're exactly where you need to be. He said, you'll be at the pay window Saturday. Exactly right. Turn them loose Saturday. They was outstanding. So they rested that whole week after all that hard work. Oh, yeah. And I still do that to this day. There's, wow. a lot of his, there's a lot of his keep. Really, my keep is pretty much based off his. My feed don't go exactly like his did. Uh, I've learned a lot about carbo loading and that kind of thing um, since then. But the base of my keep is probably still Buck Houses, hard work and common sense keep. And when I write in the game cop, that's what I write under. It's hard work and common sense. Right, right, right. So so tell me this, Don. So um, and you said your feed. Obviously, we know your feed is different than the kind of feed that he had back then. Uh, your work is pretty much the same. Um, when you rest him, when you say you rest him, what did you rest him in? Well, when I say rest, I mean I just rested him from work. But okay. also – also, Jim, and what I do, I'm, I'm real careful about a rooster's legs, especially that last week. I don't like my roosters in deep litter, period. But, uh, for example, Sleepy Hollow was another feeder, Ricky Stovall. He's one of the best feeders I ever met. He sort of took me under his wing around his time and helped me. And he's the right. guy I was telling you about in the early interview that was winning everywhere with all kinds of different roosters, speaking for a lot of people. And I go to his house and thinking I'm going to see these immaculate place. And he's got eight boxes on the creek bank with roosters tied out in the creek. And he's whipping everybody. Wow. <laughs> he's whipping it. Ain't got, ain't got a fly pin nowhere. And, and he never let his rooster scratch in anything. Uh, he didn't, he was, he's the one that convinced me that muscle or, or the largeness of muscle is not important as the flexibility. No, that's totally true. You need that's, to be flexible. That's completely, completely true. One thousand percent. And not only in these chickens, but a lot of other sports. That is totally, totally true. It is something I kind of learned being in Puerto Rico also, too. Their power training. First of all, their keep is longer. It's two and it's 10 weeks, but they only work in a bird one time a week. So it's only 10 sessions. But their power sessions will always only be at the beginning of the keep. So they divide it like kind of like in thirds. So the first third to be that power. After that, that's it. So the other two thirds of the keep, they ain't working no type of strength at all. You know, it ain't, it ain't no strength in it at all. Goes back to that same thing because they feel, and they're right, a hard muscle can't take a hit. As soon as a hard muscle get hit, it's done. It's over with. So you well, need to have a soft, flexible it's muscle. Not, it's not only that, Jim. You can't hit with a hard muscle. Uh, you right. listen. You take you take a man that's muscle bound, and he's got big wide shoulders, and he can have twenty eight inch biceps and all that. And if you can get right in front of him, you got it. He can't hurt that's you. That's right. He can't hurt that's you. Right. And you can't. A rooster cannot cut deeply if his if his chest is stuck way out. I ain't no big breast guy. Uh, I don't even like big breast in women, much less chicken. But <laughs> it's uh, I don't. I, if that breast is stuck way out there, that rooster cannot close his legs all the way. See what I'm saying? He's got if, now don't blame me wrong. I don't want him plumb poor. But uh right. now a lot of people say the way I fight mine is poor. So, so, so it's uh, I do I do bring them down a lot. But uh right. I, I don't want to have not one ounce of extra weight, you know what I mean, that, that I don't need. Right. Uh that's right. and and I and but now that's the reason if if you scratch a rooster a lot. You'll cut his breast off of him and can't get it back. You know what I mean? And and then you're building muscles in the legs that he may not need, you know? Now, some roosters do. You can feel roosters got little bitty legs, and, yeah, I need to get this rooster some litter leg scratch and build his legs up. Right. So you know what a rooster feels like and things. I mean, that's why me and Jeff talk about it often. People talk about, hey, man, I want you to keep. And listen, you know I'm glad. I'm, I'm happy to help anybody. As a matter of fact, right now what I'm doing is uh, I'm taking people for a hundred dollars. I take them through the through the pre keep and the, all the food that we buy at the grocery store because you know everything I use comes out of the grocery store. Not one thing right. comes out of the store. 
And then, right. and then the next week, they give me, and then as soon as they give me a hundred more dollars, we'll go through the two work weeks. Give me a hundred more dollars, we'll go through the point week. And so that's how I'm able to make a living right now. And uh, and I appreciate the people that have entrusted me. Um, people like Jim Sherlock, who is I have a lot of respect for. Can't believe he asked me well, anything. Jim <laughs> yeah, Jim was over here a few minutes ago. He asked me to ask you if you knew him. I'm like, I already know. If you asked that question, I already know. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Jim, Jim Sherlock is one of the most stand up guys that I know. I see him. I met him. We was both refereeing at a pit. And uh, we referee a little differently. Uh, people don't like the way I ref because what I do, I believe in the stay six foot off of them rule. And I believe in hanging down, not just hanging in. And so, but the people I was, I refereed that day and people didn't like it because I refereed the last fight. And some boys come up and they said, well, he ain't going to let us go handle them anyway. And they just pitched them in the pit and walked off. <laughs> wow. He said they don't yeah. like that, huh? Uh, no, because I got that stick, and I'll back you off from six foot. I mean, let them fight. I ain't want to stay in there no two hours. If you'll let them rest of fight, they'll get that thing settled about three bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Just let them settle. But I met, right. I met Jim then, and Jim, I've known him ever since then, and I'm telling you, he is a class act, man. I respect his character, and he's one of the guys just like you, Jim. If somebody was telling me something bad about you or that you said this and you said that, I could look at somebody and say, no, he – Jim Collins ain't done that. You know what I mean? I mean, because I know you that well. Same way with Jim Sherlock. He's a class guy. That's that's amazing, man. That is good. So I, I tell you, man, that that's like I say, and, and, and all the people watching, they know they can they can reach out on Facebook um, if they want to get in contact with you and talk to Absolutely. me about anything. Absolutely. And like I say, you know, even from the first interview, the part one of this interview, you know, I uploaded it to YouTube It's doing very well on YouTube. I uploaded it to the podcast It's doing very well on a podcast. So that, you know, anybody, that amazes me. That amazes me. Who won't listen to me? <laughs> well, I, got, I, had two, listen, this, look, I had two wives and didn't want to hear nothing I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you wasn't meant to be having the wives. You just meant to be uh, uh, talking to rooster guys. So, but but you I know the amazing part about these interviews, man, is the fact that every last guest um, are great in their own right. You know, everybody's different. Everybody's great in their own right, and it's something to learn from every single guest that came that, that comes on the show. And the funny thing is, cause I get a lot of messages saying, Oh, that, that interview was the best interview, you know, uh, you have had so far. Why well, get those same messages after every single interview? No, just from go. different people. That's you right. know what I'm saying? And, and, and you know, I got 13 people messages saying, Oh, it was the best interview, you know, that, that you had so far next Friday come, I'll get 30 messages. Oh, that was the best interview you had so far. So, you know, what I learned and why I think is extremely important, and I tell people, these interviews is like a university. It ain't never been nothing like this in history. If you You're take right. the time, if you take the time, that's exactly right. That's what all started, brother. That's what all started. If I you take that. the time, exactly, we, we, we'll never forget it. That's the amazing part about it. We'll never forget it. And and guys, if y'all watching, you know, Don Lester is, is pointing to the symbol uh, that's on a hey, hat. Girl. That he, that he's wearing. Um, that's that's a story. It's 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 a, it's a it's the beginning of everything. That's what I call it. It's the beginning of everything. The FGF stands for Feather Gladiator Fraternity, and that was the start of everything. Um, and even our relationship, Don and I relationship. Um, that's right. I started years years ago, um, and we'll get into that another time. But but you know, I tell guys, and I get a lot of questions. And what I had started doing, saying instead of answering the questions. In the interview, I say, you know what? Go back to the interview and watch it. No more of this me telling you the answer to the question. If I did my part by doing an interview, the least you can do is do your part and watch and listen, the interview. That's right. And listen, right. that's right. But exactly. But it's so many people, and, and I don't mean, and I respond to all my messages and comments. And sometimes it gets, to, and people got to understand I'm human too. You know, it gets a little frustrating sometimes when I took the time out. Got the person to do the interview. We walked through a whole bunch of stuff, spent two hours on, on the screen. And uh, and then I have somebody message me that watched part of the interview, but didn't want to take two hours of their time to watch the whole entire interview. But when it asked me a question and it answers in the interview. So what I started doing was when they asked me a question, I said, go back to this interview right here. Somebody asked me another question. Go back to this person interview, because what well, I learned is, is if you don't do the research, it won't mean anything to you anyway. 
If you don't exactly. invest time into it, it don't mean anything. So it don't any, mean anything, anything easy ain't easy. worth it. So anything easy ain't worth it. And the thing is, it, it separates from the people who really want to know the answer to the people who just want to know the quick answer. A lot of guys just want to be told. They don't want to do any work. They want to be able to just pick up the phone and say, how you do this, this, and this. They don't want to do no trial and error. They don't want to put in no hard work. They don't want to make no mistakes or nothing. They want somebody to be able to tell them, don't do that and do this. And and, and I think my they should have they, they come up when I came up. Because them old cockers, they didn't mind telling you what to do so they could bet against you next weekend. <laughs> oh, they, oh, yeah, I'll tell you exactly what you do. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Mark Muggs talked about the same thing. You know, Mark Muggs, Mark, Mark Muggs, I think, talked about, and I could be wrong, but I think he was one of the ones on the interview said that he asked one way back in the day, and they just told him uh, to keep feeding the rooster. You know, keep feed, feed him as much as he can eat. Like, yeah, that's what they do, man. They do all kinds of crazy stuff. Put him in a dark box and don't feed him nothing for three days. You know, and that's the thing about it. I think, like I say, you know, it's a lot of questions out there. But with all of the interviews that we have done, if you watched all those interviews, not saying you wouldn't have to ask any questions, but I promise you, you should be able to do very well from the knowledge that has been put out here already oh, through all of these interviews. I'm There's talking more from incubators, raising chicks, natural hatches, setting up stags, feed, medication, vaccinate. I mean, the interviews cover everything from very successful cockers in their own right. Nobody ever came on the show and say they're the best, but everybody's been good at what they do. And, and Jim, here's the thing. Nobody can claim to be the best. Because what well, you right. might be the best this year, but guess what? Next year's another story. Um <laughs> uh, and, and I and I and like you said, I have fed for a lot of different people and I've been very fortunate in that because it taught me a lot of different things. Because like you say, there's a lot of different kinds of roosters and every rooster don't do the same. And and it's like I said, my time at the Velcro farm was uh, the Velcro man taught me a lot. He let me stuck my toe a little bit. To find out, so I'd learned good, and he and I did learn good. But his uh, his my time with him was invaluable. It really was. Well, you know what, Don? Since you since you brought him up, because that was somebody we were going to talk about. But since you brought him up, let's kind of talk about how you met him. How did it all start with the with the Velcro man? Well, I I, I knew uh, we call him Dog, and I knew Dog for a long time. Dog had moved from Ohio down to Oglethorpe County, which is the county I'm from in Georgia, and, and the dog was very, very successful. Uh, I didn't even know how successful because the dog was fighting mains. Uh, he wasn't fighting big derbies. He was fighting mains. And he, uh, he spent, he, and this between you and I, uh, back in the day, um, he spent $110,000 with William Medall, and he was William Medall's best customer who created the Velcros. In two years, he spent 110 grand. Well, guess what? He turned around one, I think, it was 56 straight mains with them chickens. And he wow. got to know him. I mean, he was he's good, buddy. And I would put his record up to date against any cocker living anywhere, as far as the percentage wise. He is a smart man. Now, when I first met him, dog is real, dog is as backward as I am forward. So we didn't really jihad, you know what I mean? We really didn't. And uh and but he had had some problems, he needed some help. I was in a place where uh, I was getting back into foul business and I, I wanted to help somebody and, and it just gee on and it worked and we're great friends to this day. As a matter of fact, I got to show his roasters out yonder right now that's some Chet Velcros that I would put against anybody anywhere, anytime. I'm just telling you. He's a, uh, uh, he's a, uh, I mean, I don't know of anybody. I know of people that's claimed to have some 90% seasons. He's the only guy I know to do it. The only guy I know. Uh, he's a he's an excellent he's an excellent chicken man. He's a little he's right. a little quiet. He's he's gonna ask he ain't gonna explain nothing. You gonna ask him a question? They gonna say yes or no, and that's what you are gonna get. <laughs> so that's that's it. <laughs> right, yes or no, huh? So 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 walk us through it. So you met met him. How did you? And you said you you know he kind of had a situation. So you end up going out to move with him and start feeding right. for him. And then how right. was it going out there? How was that experience? Well, uh, it was great, and I'm telling you, and, and what dog would do, I mean, I, I think I shared this with you last time. I remember first, them Velcros are strange chickens. They're just strange chickens. 
And uh, you can feed them like you do everything else. Now, he's crossed some blood into them now that's made them a lot more like other roosters, but really better. But they, uh, he's had them a long time, and they're close bred. And how do I fed a show out? He said, just do what you do. Do what you do. I said, okay. I put them out. I went down there and won one, lost three. <laughs> and look, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And he's just, I said, man, I'm sorry. He just smiled. He said, oh, that's, I, I knew we was going to do it. I said, you knew we was going to do it. Why didn't you help me? He said, well, uh, you want to learn that way. He said, I'll tell you what you do. Do just what you just did, and then we'll spar them. He said, then we're going to put them on cords and forget about them to the day of the fight. I said, what? He said, yeah, do, do what I tell you to. We done it, win the derby. Wow. He knew, them. he knew them. They couldn't be, they didn't like that confinement, and they didn't like that coming up, like I like a chicken coming up. They didn't really, they get freaky on that. You know what I mean? They needed to be relaxed to do their best. They didn't need to be coming to you real fast. They need to be relaxed. Right. They didn't need that pin up, shaking. You know, I, most of the time I feed a rooster and I feed them natural. But when you go to heal them, their legs will be trimmed, you know. Right. And uh, they, they didn't do good that way. They wanted, they needed to be relaxed to fight good. And by golly, they do good too. They still do they good. Do. Well, tell me this, Don. So how about how about let's talk about his feeding regimen, you know, because obviously when you're going from feeder to feeder, to, I mean, from – from you know place to place to place, you know I, I'm pretty sure things are 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 different every place yeah. that you go. Well, so dog, so dog was probably the most health conscious person I've ever met, as far as the health of his file. I say James is the same way now, uh, of course Jeff too, but he was uh, also the most one of the most ruthless colors I've ever met. Um, I, I tell the story often of we was walking out through the yard one day and. I get hay fever with that. All them pear trees start blooming, them ruthless Bradford pears that ain't worth a dime for nothing. When they go to blooming, I get hay fever bad, and that's usually around April. We was walking out in his yard one day, and a, a stag sneezed. Mm-mm, last sneeze right there. Then he turned around and looked at me and had that stick in his hand. He said, how are you feeling? I said, I feel great. I don't know. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, I can remember I, I can remember. I come around this corner one day, his, he's got a breed of white hackers that he has had forever. And he right. uh and, they, and they're kernies and they're absolutely the most wonderful general chickens I've ever seen. Long legs, best white hacker chickens I know of. But he uh I went and got one that I really liked. And he was a little white legged red roaster. And they I very few of them come white legged, and that's what did, and he sort of stood out to me. And I come around the corner to him and he said, Let me see that roaster. I stopped, handed him to him. He pulled his head off. I said, what did, how, why did you, <laughs> right. it was a perfect roaster. He said, I saw him chase his tail the other day. That was enough. You know what I mean? I mean, and that's why he's as good as he is. Of course, I come around there with another one. He said, let me see that roaster. I said, ain't no way. Uh-uh, get away from me. <laughs> Stay away from the chicken, man. <laughs> but he is hey, a roaster. He is a ruthless color. And let me tell you something else, Jim, that I can say about dog, and this is the truth because I fed for him. Dog will sell his best chickens and keep the coals. You know, he don't raise no coal coals, but a rooster's got a toenail off or something like that, and he's not going to sell that rooster. He's going to sell the best he's got and keep the rest and still win 85 or 90% of them. Now he's a now that's a good rooster man. I don't care what nobody says. Not just me feeding them. Other people feeding them. Some people have done better than I have with them. Uh, cause they figured them out quicker. Uh there's a gentleman in Ohio doing excellent with them. So it's uh it's they they're good chickens. They really are. And he's 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 a good breeder. He breeds different so, than anybody I've ever seen. So he do, he huh? So everything about him is all different, huh? Listen, listen, this is I got him out in the uh, we was drinking one night, feeling pretty good, and I, I won't tell you that. Lord, I started to say something else. That might get him in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I don't do that. But anyway, we were, conservative you know, with your story. Right. We were sitting there. We were saying, "Yeah, this is fiction." We were sitting there talking, and I, t he t I told him, "I said, dog, I said, man, how did you did you get some new blood in these chickens? You got to understand that I went with him to Big Blue one time." Mm -hmm. And this was late. This is when I first was going to come to Kentucky, right? 
And these had got all these black Velcros, and he said, hey, man, get that now, that scratch me. And I opened the pin top, and I never seen the rooster again. He flew over my <laughs> He flew off the mountain. I don't know where he went. <laughs> they were wild and crazy. And I said, man, right. what in the world is all? You know, that was just real high-strung chicken. And then I get down there to feed for them, and they just calm and gentle as they can be. And I said, man, how did you – what happened here? Did you get some new blood? Did you find somebody that had the Velcros and get some new blood and add to them? He just laughed. He said, you ain't going to believe me when I tell you. I said, why? He said, son, I have single-mated these chickens ever since I got them. He said, there's still some I do single mate. He said, but I, when I started losing them, when I started seeing my percentage goes down and when I started seeing the roosters were different, it was getting too close. He said, I take the hens. And I put six cocks on cords in a pen. His brood pens would be covered with a net, be 100 foot long by 60 foot wide. But he'll turn wow. the hens loose in with the roosters and let the hen pick the rooster. Mm -hmm. He said they started coming bigger, longer legged, better sense, better station. Everything about them was better. And they was like different chickens. So, and I mean, that's something that goes exactly against what everybody else does. That's but right. but now think about this because it makes sense to me. Everybody out there has got a hen running loose or four or five hens running loose or 50 running loose with the cocks. And they'll come off with a clutch of eggs. And you know what cock they bred to that time, but time they're two years old, you can't remember. And it, right. I mean, we call them yard monkeys. Okay. Right. And you, you'll have some yard monkeys that you can scan out with. You're like, man, I wish I knew how these were bred. <laughs> bring them back. I, well, I I know somebody that got about a hundred of them, and I'm telling you right now, um, you know, I know somebody from back in the day that you know had a hundred of them, and from them yard monkeys, like you said, and don't know how they bred, but man, is the best stuff that he ever had since he been in game foul. But you know I'm the crazy you. thing about it, if you look back at the interview with the doctor, when a doctor came on, he said that's how he breeds. He breathes by letting the hen. He believes the only way, you know, and that's just his method. He said, I believe the only way you should do a breeding is you have to let the hen pick the rooster, not the other way around, period. You know, you have to let the hen pick the rooster the other way around. He sure. can tie a rooster up to the tie cord and, 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 and see exactly what hen is going to go on over there and let him mate him. Made her. They're, smart. They're smarter than we are sometimes, Jim. Boy, I'm glad the human race don't work out like that. I never would have had kids. <laughs> well, so. I tell you what, man. It's, it's, it's amazing because, again, now look. Two people from two different parts of the world with the same identical concept, and either one of them don't know each other, and it's been the same results. The doctor from the Republic, you know, the, the dog from here, these guys use the same method, don't know each other, and got the same darn result. Now, probably I don't know if it's always like that because I got I know somebody with some yard monkeys, and that's exactly what they are. They monkeys, you know what I mean? They monkeys, right. but that's probably right. because the well, well, was monkeys and, also. And they probably got way too many bloodlines. You got to understand, dogs got three bloodlines of chickens, mm -hmm. four at the most. You know what I mean? And that's all he's ever gonna have. And uh, he's like, hey, that's the most you ever need. And of course, now he's got families bred within those families. And uh, I'm not saying that that's the only way he raises chickens. That's not. He has single mated pens too, so he'll know what hen to turn loose in there with them roosters. But he right. still that's that's just and and had somebody told me that before I experienced that, I said, well, that's an idiot. Right. But no, exactly. He was a genius, is what he was. <laughs> He's a genius. Well, you know what? That's exactly right. But Don, that, that's that's a very valid point. And I just want to just compliment that was the fact that that's why I tell people it's not no really such thing as common sense, because what you think don't make no sense. I promise you, if you're in this game foul industry long enough, you'll find somebody that is working for. And that's what I have yeah. learned. You know, I tell me, man, that don't make any sense. Don't do that. If you travel enough and you see enough, you'll find somebody doing something that you thought should not work. And they having success with it. And I just seen that from everything, from feed, from exercise, from breeding methods, from pen, you know, yard setups. It's like, wow, you know, I, I didn't think that made any sense. And you'll find somebody making it work. Well, well just like Jim, I, I stayed with Hugh Norman for a summer. Hugh Norman was a poultry genetist by trade. Hugh Norman got $60 an hour just to talk to people. 
I can't tell you how many number one cockers in the United States is today was at his yard to get brood fowl. And he would inbreed chickens for three generations. And if they couldn't stand three generations of inbreeding and beef that game, he discarded the whole family. And, buddy, he was rough the way he done it. You know what I mean? And But now, wow. you didn't get no chickens from Hugh Norman that wasn't game. Now, Hugh Norman, there's no way he would do anything like dog does. But by golly, they're both successful. You know what I mean? So that's the. There's just different ways to get there. There's different ways to feed. There's different ways to breed. And uh, until I get James started on this uh, cloning roosters, it's always going to be that way. Once we get to cloning roosters, y'all through. Y'all through. We got all the money. Okay. <laughs> we gonna clone the best car guy here and have a hundred of the best roasts we got, and then y'all, and then we don't even need no hands or nothing. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, listen, Don. I, uh, just real quick, Tom Kane. If you're watching, you did ask if we if we if we do take questions, we will take some questions. So if you're still watching, um, go ahead and post a question that you would like to uh like to ask uh, Don. Um, also, too, Don, just real quick, I'm just going to scroll through uh, some of these comments. I don't know if you can see them on your end, um, but I, I can see them on my end. Yeah, I can't see them. Oh, you can't? Okay, okay. Um, all right, so listen, a couple couple things I kind of want to revert back, uh, some older comments, and I didn't want to interrupt you. Let's just talk okay. a little bit about that buttermilk. Now, you said you do you always feed buttermilk throughout the whole day, uh, whole week, or, you know, is it a couple days a week? How you feed your buttermilk? I soak my buttermilk. I usually mix my feed. Luckily, I'm I, I I have been fortunate enough that I don't have to work, and uh, so I so I start soaking my feed at lunch usually for my PM feed. I used to soak it in the morning when I worked if I left to go to work. But no, I I'd cover my feed with buttermilk, and I always use homemade buttermilk if you can get it. Thank you, girl. <laughs> Jeff Chapman, man, we, we may be using store bought buttermilk, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, if y'all don't know, it's 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 a story behind what what Don is saying about that buttermilk because they they get their buttermilk from the Amish. You know, not very many of us live next to Amish, but they get they 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 buttermilk from the Amish. And uh, they went out there. We, we, we used to get our buttermilk from the Amish. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. I think the Amish still going to take that money because you know they don't want that coronavirus, so they figure they'll take that money anyway. But uh. But from the Amish and today when they went out there, uh, Jeff messed around and backed into and hit one of the Amish horses and then drove <laughs> off and he stopped. So, you know, when he showed me, he, 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 I don't know he's going to be able to show back up there. If, 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 if we can't get through the interview, it's because the Amish police showed up on horseback and got us, okay? I'm we, pretty sure one of them got my plate number. Yeah, we got a hit and run at the Amish place. <laughs> Jim is the wildest thing I've ever seen. That horse just jumped out in front of me. <laughs> it did, huh? Uh, it, 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 it he was going to stop. And I'm like, no, don't stop. We can't pay him. We ain't got no money. This is their car, man. We got to go. We can stop. <laughs> that, horse, that horse was sitting there shaking his head like this. Like, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> What well, they funny about man. their horses, man. They funny about their horses. <laughs> well, they should. They should be funny because, like you said, that's their car. But that's listen, right. Don. So you said, you, do you feed once or twice a day? I feed twice a day, and I believe in feeding twice a day, even if you ain't got them up. And I'm gonna tell you why. There's a reason behind that. If you're having a lot of problems with your roosters getting gut shots, or you're having a lot of problems with your roosters getting gizzard shots and gizzard blows. If you'll feed your roosters twice a day then they ain't got as much feed on them at one time, and it makes it good and smaller. It makes a gut smaller. It's just like you eating one big meal a day or eat two small meals a day. You're gonna be, your, your gut health will be a lot better eating two small meals a day. Now, with James right. cooking, I'm eating about three big meals a day, so I'm about to go down. But it's well, uh, <laughs> well, he ain't going to he gonna have to put you up. But uh, <laughs> So you, you like to do the two times a day, and uh, it, it ain't that much feed in them all at one time. And uh, you just feel as though, too, you know, if you run into any problems, it's a lot less feed in them that they have right. to tolerate. To well, that gives it smaller. So it's a smaller target because it's, 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 it's processing less amount of feed at a time. Plus, the roaster's a whole lot more active because he's not, you just like, he's they just like us. He's, if you feed a rooster behind the sausage can full of feed, you watch him in 30 minutes, he's up on the roast pole sleep. 
Right. You got him in the fly pen, he's up on a roost post that now. Now right. he's just like us. You give me a James fix me a big meal, I might go to bed. That's right. I got you. No, I understand. But so that's, a lot that's more active. a lot more active. Now tell me something. Do you just kind of just divide the feed in half that you would normally feed them one whole full portion? Like if you I used feed, to feed them four ounces, you divide it yeah, in half? Yes, sir. I feed I usually feed about a half a cup. We feed a quarter a cup okay. twice a day. Yeah. So it makes a half a cup. And uh, if you got roosters wormed out well, that's usually good. Now, sometimes during the keep, you'll get that thing up to a third of a cup twice a day because they're eating and throwing their feed real well. And that's fine. Right. You want them to eat and throw as much as they can, have as much strength as they can. Plus, that when you go to pulling it from them, um, they get their guts to draw up even tighter. Uh, what, what, makes us a rooster, what makes a rooster take cutting is the fact that his guts is not laying in his body cavity. His guts are drawed up. You know what I'm saying? So right. so the body cavity is just clear. Um, you're not really hitting anything. You know what I mean? But right. if your guts is laying in the bottom of your body cavity and you get hit in the in the body cavity, you're sick. You're gonna get sick right. real quick. That's right, that's right. So so tell me this, Don, there's two things, two questions. Uh Tom Kane wanted to ask you, what's your favorite exercise? Ooh, what's my favorite exercise? Chasing women. No, not you. Being a oh, you know my chicken. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, actually, my favorite exercise probably is just flying the rooster to the bench. When I fly a rooster to the bench, I let him fly himself. Now I'm gonna tell you something else. I do is I don't use the bench as much as I use the back of a chair. I want a rooster to be able to fly and put his feet on something. What I'm trying to do is give his eye and foot coordination good. If you just fly a rooster to a bench, he don't, he's not really landing in a certain spot. Right. But if you fly him to the back of a chair, he's got to he's got to know where his feet's going to hit. Don't he's going to miss it. That's so right. you, you just get the eye to hand coordination a little better. So I guess flying to the back of a chair, and if you can use a bar stool that's got that you can put a perch on it that moves, that's even better. That's even better. That's it. So you a moving perch you think will be if somebody can build something to kind of have like a moving perch you think that'd even be better than the back of the bar stool well, or back well, of the chair? I tell you why you learn a lot about where a rooster lands his feet first. A lot of roosters is right legged and we don't know it. If you flying that rooster from behind and that stool turning to the left, then that rooster's hitting his right work feet foot first for his left one. Right. If it's turning, if they hit even, that's fine. But it's going the other way, and he's hitting his left one first. So you can find out if a rooster's right-legged or not. If you got a right-legged rooster, you might not want him in the short night. Got you, got you, got you, got you. I'm going to ask you one other question also, too. We got Tom Kane's on there. Uh, Michael Hill asks about, do you use desiccated liver? No, sir, I don't. I, everything I use, I try to stay away from processed anything. Uh, try right. to stay as natural as I can. I use beef liver out of the store. If you can find calf liver, that's better. If you can find hog liver, that's the best. Okay, you said hog liver is better than the calf liver, huh? Yes, sir. It's, it's always done better for me. It's just really hard to find. Uh, if we can find us another Amish farm, and if we're not blackballed, we might find some of them there. So, let's see. <laughs> you might, I don't think y'all guys are going to be blackballed, but I want to ask you another question, too. That's coming from uh, Brandon Mattis, which is about us. Uh, said, ask Don to tell us about the uh, Del Rio story. Oh, no. See, there might be some women and children listening. So we can't tell that story. Okay. <laughs> so I'll tell that story. I, I, I tell that story when I'm sitting at that kitchen table. <laughs> His cigar going to be really mad if I tell that story. So I ain't trying to make a win with him tonight. Listen, let me, I'm going to go ahead. And, and you know, this would be a great time, too, to do some, you know, some Q&A. Um, also, too, we already over an hour mark anyway. We, you know, we okay. already over an hour. But again, let, let's go ahead and just do a little bit of Q&A. Uh, Tony Osmo asks, uh, Don, can you tell us how you make your oregano medicine? Well, now, I've got a lady named Tracy McLean, uh, whom the first interview was at her house, who actually makes it for me. Uh, the last batch she sent me was really strong. Um, she, so, so I would have to refer that question to her. She does it. Um, but you can buy it on eBay. I mean, you can find a rec you can buy oregano oil on eBay for anywhere from eight to $14 a bottle. So it's, I mean, it's not a, no secret to make it. Um, I like it when she makes it just, just because I know what she does. Okay. Done.
Can you hear you, Jim? Got you, got you. And Don, your 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 audio, your video went out a little bit. It's starting to refocus and refocus, so it kind of went out a little bit. Okay, am I there now? Okay, you should be good. Okay. Yeah, you're you're here now. So Tony, just to let you know, what Don basically said is, you know, he had somebody make his oregano uh, oil. But uh, it's something he still recommend that you can just buy it from, uh, you know, from eBay or either probably Amazon. Also, we buy ours from yeah. Amazon. Yeah. So eBay, okay. Amazon said it's not really no big secret to it. You know, you just want to kind of use oregano oil. So since we're talking about oregano oil, you know, uh, in what scenarios do you use oregano oil? How often do you use oregano oil? Uh, Jim, mostly you want to use oregano. I tell you what, oregano oil, it's like a bronchiolator. It will clear okay. their bronchial tubes. If you've got a rest that don't have a good sharp crow. You give them that oregano oil and you'll start having one. And and you can tell if you give it to them. When you first give it to them, they're going to shake your head and sit back on their haunches and that kind of thing. But in five minutes, they they act like they're a different roast. They act like they're almost coming on point or something. So it's uh, right. it's uh, uh, but it's because they can breathe so much better. Now, what I do is I give it – if I hear roast or rattle, I'm going to give them about a half an uh, uh, eyedropper full. Uh, and usually one time is all you got to do it. But if I'm just starting him in the key, I'll give him a quarter eye drop of food or something like that. And when you're working roasters, you can tell them once it get labored fast and right. maybe, you know, you know, having some kind of breathing deals. Right. So it's uh, and that, so just use your own judgment on it. But uh, I don't think you can right. give too much. I don't guess. I don't try to give a whole lot. But I right. seem to be world known for oregano. I'll just start selling oregano oil out of my pocket. Well, 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 let me tell you, Don, it goes back to this. You know, uh, it, when you first talked about the oregano oil uh, on the first interview, a lot of guys doubted you uh, on that oregano oil. But if you notice about a week later, those same guys came back on a comment section of the of the interview and commented and said, hey, dude, that oregano oil actually worked. You know, I I doubted it from the beginning when you said it because one guy posted, oh, I never seen anything, any medicine working two days and a day and all this and that. But he was man enough to come back on a week later and said, you know what? I used that oregano oil and I actually seen a difference in one day. He said he went out there the next day and he had a totally different bird with that oregano oil. And look, that's the only way you can teach roaster fighters anything is prove it to them. That's the only way they're going to believe it. I always say you got to show them better than you can tell them. That's, That's it. Right. That's the same. Let your bird show me better than you can tell me. And if we start exactly. doing that, you're right. That's the only way they're going to learn. Jim, i tell you what I'm going to do. My phone, my phone, I'm fitting to pick his phone up and charge it up because it's getting a little low, and that may be a problem with the, with the thing. So just hang with me here, and let me get okay. over here and put this thing up for you. So and I, I want to just uh, answer Salvador. Uh, Salvador, your question was answered about the fly pins. You just go back to a little early in the interview. Uh, Don talked about his fly pins of five by five by twelve. Uh, he put the perch one at six foot and one at nine and a half feet. Um, they usually able to fly to the six foot perch at first, um, but usually not able to fly to the nine and a half feet perch. But over time, they work their way up and they're able to fly uh, to the nine and a half feet perch. So I just wanted to post that question up there because that's one of the questions that was asked. And guys, you know, typically we don't ask a lot of questions uh, during the interview because, as you know, it gets stretched really, really long. And uh, we'll start, you know, we will cover some of the topics that we want to talk about. So, Don, I'm, I'm going to just pause on asking the questions um, and go back to the feed. So you feed twice a day. You told us why you feed twice a day. I think I'm getting some feedback. All right. Can you see me? Yeah, I can see you, but I think I'm getting feedback probably since you plugged in. All right. Let me unplug something. Uh-oh. Let me plug into another plug in here, Jim. Er, hang on with me. Oh, maybe that plug-in wasn't no good now. Is that better? Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Okay. I that that other plug-in had our incubator plugged into it, so that may have been a problem. Okay. All right. So listen, Don. Uh, guys, all all the viewers out there watching, I see your questions. I'll have Don go in the comment section uh, after the interview is over. So he can, you know, he can address those questions because, as you know, his battery's running low. And we still got some other stuff that I would like to talk about. Um, so, Don, let's let's just kind of jump back into the feed. So you feed twice a day. You put buttermilk every day. 
you said you pretty much uh, start soaking your feet through halfway through the day because you know you feed twice a day and you don't work, so you're able to do it. But you were working, you was you was your feed in the morning, so you really don't soak your feet for a long period of time, right? Well, no, and and, and Buck Hall's always said just cover your feed with the buttermilk and let it soak itself up. And once it soaks itself up, it's done what it's gonna do. Um, and and buttermilk I always say, you know, you know, me and James was talking about this today. Uh, I want to know the science behind the buttermilk. I'm sure now we didn't know nothing about probiotics back then, but I'm sure buttermilk's got good probiotics in it. Now, just like I told you in the last telecast, if you want to give real probiotics to your rooster, if that's a problem, give him give him sauerkraut. That's your best best method of getting probiotics into a chicken. Way better than yogurt. Way better than yogurt. But the uh, right. the buttermilk. I think that was just. Uh, I think that's one of the things that helped. You know, all the all the old timers would use it. And said it gave you a hard lick in the drag. Well, I think it just gave good gut health. You know. So so and Don, so you saying also in your feet right now, you just starting out and you just trying the red beet juice, right? So you haven't got that kind of down to a sign chip, but you're trying it out so far. I like it. Uh, and I hadn't got it down to exactly where I want it, but I like it. Yes, I, I, I think I'm going to be using it from now on. Um, and it's it's not real hard to find. Uh, I had never heard of it, and I had to search for it, but you can get it at Walmart. Uh, I recommend getting an organic blend, and, and if you can't find it, just get you some canned beets and use the juice out of it. And I feed That's the right. beets also. So. Oh, you feed the beets also? Yes, yes. I it. Since I started doing that, I started feeding some of the beets, mixing it up with their feed, uh, and and if you read about beets, I had no idea they're really a superfood. Now something yeah, else, I'm, I, something else I'm I want to to experiment with, and I'm going to experiment with this season is that royal jelly. Uh, royal jelly is a superfood. Uh, I yep. think it could be really okay. beneficial, especially toward the end of the key. Yep, I learned that about that royal jelly and that beet. But they put a lot of beets also too in dog food. If people look at the ingredients, a lot of times in dog food, some a lot of dog foods have beets in it. Um, but I, I learned about that royal jelly and that desiccated liver from from some studies that the military had done on endurance and stanum and stuff like that. So uh, that they kind of did. They started out doing it with lab rats, but then they obviously they start doing it with uh, with humans, with soldiers. Um, so so those are the kind of two things that you do. You said that you div pretty much would divide your feed up, uh, what you would feed in, in one portion. You kind of divide it up uh, into two portions of feed twice a day. Now, do you yes. try to feed the exact same time every single day? Yes, sir. Uh, the closer you can stay to schedule, the better they are. I um, mean, that's, that's true for you, too. You know, if you can eat them the same meal at the same time every day. Your, your body's going to adjust to it and your guts and all will be in better health. I think we're just now finding out with the probiotic deal how important gut health is to a chicken. And, and it's, I, think uh, humans, I think it's really yeah, important. Are starting to find out. Humans now are starting to find out how important gut health is also because you'll start to see commercials now about different things, that supplements that they have out there to help you with your gut health. Um, so that's something I didn't see five years ago. You know, to be right, honest, maybe, I haven't seen it. It, it was stuff we were using stuff, just like the buttermilk. I'm sure it's got good probiotics in it, especially when you get right. it homemade. But we didn't know what the scientific reason was. We just knew it worked. Right. But uh, right. but I think that scientific reason is probiotics, and I'm sure Mr. Barnes can expound on that. Probably will after I get out of this conversation. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, listen here. So, so you know, obviously, there's a lot of questions in the comments section. You know that you can go back and address once you get time because we we okay. not going to be able to do the too much Q and A because you're running low on battery and uh, and and the, the questions are not stopping. So, um, so we got the feed. We talked about the exercise. Now, tell me this: uh, Do you use rotation? You know, back in the day, were, were you a big fan of rotation at all? Well, well, you gotta understand, Jim. When I first started, I had a job, so I mean, I couldn't rotate, you know. Uh, but yeah, I'm a big fan of it now. And as a matter of fact, I think I'm at my best. I really feel like I'm at my best when I got. And I know a lot of people can't do this because they work, but if I've got 50 roasters up at one time, and I'm out in the yard with them, and I'm working, with, you know, I may have one show I'm working in the morning, one show I'm working at lunch, one show I'm working at night. My night roasters are. The roosters I like to compete with at night, I'm going to work at night. Uh, so 
I may, but if I have 50 roosters up and they're all, and I'm rotating them all all the time, I seem to do better. That seems to work better for me. So it's uh, the more roosters I can have up in rotation, the better. And the more, and if a rooster gets up and sits down on a roost pole, he's got to go somewhere. He got to get in a run pen or he's got to get in a different, he got to get in a scratch pen. He got to go somewhere. And you'll find that some roosters like some pens and don't like others, you know. So you just got to figure out which ones they like. Which ones they like. And the same thing you said about the bedding also, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a, I, I put a roost on the cord the other day. Matter of fact, I've got a roost on the cord right now. And he don't like that end cord. He don't like being the first rooster on the end. Some roosters do. Some roosters don't. And that rooster don't. So I've got to move him up in the middle tomorrow. So he's, uh, I mean, it's, those are just things that you notice. That's right. So, Don, tell me this. And I saw, and, I, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people have seen pictures of it that you posted when you had those birds, when you had a rooster down there by the river, by the creek bed. Yes, sir. I do that every time I can, and I'll tell you why. Very fortunate here. And uh, when I fed for Tom Hagen's and I was at his house, very fortunate there, too, because it flooded there often. Well, flooding's a bad thing. It's a good thing, too. There's a silver lining in it because that water that's churned up and that soil that's churned up, that's just churning minerals. And when that ground comes up on top of the ground that you've got now, well, you've got fresh ground. So, and of course, right. roosters have got to have sand, but I'm confident. Me and James and Jeff was talking about this today. Uh, I'm confident there's things that roosters get that we've not even discovered, just like the probiotics. There's things they get on the yard. I'm confident of this. If I had, if we're not blackballed from the Amish, and if I had 10 Amish yards that I could run a cock on, that I'd be very hard to will. Because roosters can do better by themselves than we can do for them. You know what I mean? And there's things out there. I mean, that's a real natural way to do it. If I had a rooster gentle, put him on a yard for a month, caught him up the last three days, he'd be hard to whip. He would be right. very hard to whip. That's right. That's right. Yeah, no, no, no. And, and again, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. Closer to nature, the better off you're going to be. The further that's you right. move away from nature, worst off you're going to be physically, exactly. mentally, everything. everything. Exactly. Um, Me and you and yeah. the chicken. That's right. That's exactly. We was talking about that earlier. That's exactly right. I mean, between humans, I mean, the native Indians talked about it all the time. You know, native Indians talked about, you know, the further you move away from nature, the worst off you're going to be for animals oh, and for humans. Yeah. Right. And I'm sitting here with a chop tile. So, yeah, he agrees with you. <laughs> 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 well, listen, Don. So, you know, again, we still got a little bit of time. I know your battery is running low, but I still want to oh, pull a little I'm bit. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm plugged in now, Jim. I'm good to go. So we, we're good now. Okay. Listen, I do, well, want, listen I, do want, I do want, if you don't mind, I want to take time. I want to thank somebody. Uh, okay. There's number one, I want to wish my granddaughter a happy birthday coming up Wednesday. She's the light of my life. Oh, my I want to wish her a happy birthday. And uh, right. I want to thank Todd Keithley, Todd and Joanne Keithley. They, they are not well known anywhere in the cocking world, but around here in Kentucky. Uh, good old country boy and has let me feed his roasted. I'm going to tell you, got some of the best butcher chickens I've ever seen. And uh, they're just good people, and they've just had a newborn child, and I appreciate them. Uh, of course, Jeff and James both, but also Michael Hill. I'm going to tell you about Michael. I know he's had one of those questions in your thing. My, you know, we all should encourage each other. Michael okay. encourages me. Michael thinks I'm a superhero. I don't know why he don't put his standards no higher. <laughs> but, but, but he encourages me. I can be having a bad day and Michael send me a message and I'm like, man, I got to pick my game up. <laughs> you know what I mean? This guy, I got to do a little better. So I want to give a shout out to Michael and tell him thank you, man, for all the encouragement he gives me. Right, right, right. Well, I think, uh, again, th these are just all of the parts of the things I really think is extremely important to highlight. Um, and then, like I said, I know this ain't the sexy part of the sport or the most entertaining part of the sport, but I think it's the backbone of the sport. And why I say that is because, again, we are painted so bad out in society, but we're Absolutely. known very little. You know, we're, we're known very little. And it's because, you know, for decades, 
uh, we were not highlighting the other aspects of our lives, how hard we work, how dedicated we are, how much sacrifice you put in, the, the amazing memories that we create, the amazing relationships that we create. You know, none of that kind of stuff is highlighted. And I think some guys come into our culture with the wrong perception. They come in with the perception of all the shiny, the flash, the win, 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 win. Well, it's more, so much more to our oh, culture, yeah. to our lifestyle, than trophies. And, and, and some guys don't like when I say that, you know, but at the end of the day, that's just my personal opinion. And I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything else. But I think as we have as game foul readers, we have a lot more to bring to the table than just trophies. Well, well, let's let's just think about it this way, Jim. And uh, uh, I've talked to you about this before. Who would have thought that ex Klansmen like myself, that you and I could be as close of friends as we are? I was raised up in the clan. I didn't know no better. I had to learn better. One of the hardest lessons you'll ever learn is that mom and dad taught you wrong. You know, right. and I feel like I feel like you're a brother to me. You're one of the right. few people that I give the right to hold me accountable. And right. you have the time or two, and I and I appreciate it because you always done it for my benefit. And I certainly appreciate it. You've got to have people that you allow to do that to you. The two gentlemen that live in this house with me have the right to hold me accountable. And, it's, uh, and, and there needs to be more of that in our sport. We need to, you know, be, have some people close to you that can hold you accountable because we don't know it all. And sometimes we get right. out of hand and sometimes we get in our feelings. And you've had to call me down the time, too, about getting in my feelings. <laughs> so, That's right. And, That's and right. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Right. And, 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 you know, Don, that's that's exactly right. And, you know, from the beginning, um, you know, we have had some tough conversations and I think uh, those conversations are needed. But I always have said to you, James, Jeff, anybody surrounded by me and know me knows one thing, you know, I'm going to speak my truth. And if you can't take my truth, then we don't really need to communicate. I have told right. you that, Jeff that, James that, and everybody close to me. And everybody know they can speak their truth to me without getting angry. You know, we can speak our truth to each other and not catch an attitude, set our opinions to the side and say, hey, listen, this is the way I feel. And it's not a right or wrong thing, but we need to be able to speak our truth to each other. And That's it right. goes back to, like I say, the older guys need to hold a higher standard to a lot of these people coming into the sport, you can't just give up and throw the talent and say, oh, he's just going to do what he wants, just forget about it. No. We got mm -mm. to, one, lead Look, by example. That's the, reason somebody the else older, that's the reason the older guys have stayed in it so long is because we had to earn our way in. Nobody give us that's nothing. Right. We had to lose right. for 10 years before we learned how to win. You know what I mean? I mean, it was, it, after I won that first derby in Tacoma, Hey, I went through about an eight or seven, eight year period there if I won another. You know what I mean? I mean, it was Six. tough. So that's just the way it goes. Now, and that's by the, the way, and, and Jim, it's, it's uh, I mean, me and you've talked about this many times. Yes, we do need to hold each other accountable. We don't need to get mad when we do, and we do get mad. We need to get over it. Uh, just right. for example, Tim Sizemore and I had a had a very we we had a disagreement. As a matter of fact, Tim Sizemore barred me from two different fishing holes. Uh, and one day for life. Now, I've been barred a lot from a lot of places. Matter of fact, I always tell everybody, stick with me and I'll take you places we can't go back to. But <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, and stick with Jeff and you can't go back to the Amish. But anyway, we, <laughs> anyway, we, but me and, me and Tim come to an agreement, and Jeff actually is the one that negotiated that agreement because it got ugly. And now Tim is a very close friend of mine. I do anything for Tim. Well, we got to get what we can do that. You know what I mean? We got to get what we can get over our little hurt feelings and, and get we, – we, we sound like a bunch of old women sometimes. And we need to get over hey. all that, you know. For sure. <laughs> no, let me tell you, Don, what you just said is 1,000% correct. And let me tell you some of the things, and, and hopefully, you know, some people can kind of learn from – because, again, we're all human and we all make mistakes. Uh, and this is one thing I have kind of learned, and I would say like a life lesson. With all this traveling, me meeting all these people, me dealing with all this doubt, you know, criticism, critique and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I had got to a point where, you know, I've been on Facebook for years. I've been pushing the same message and I always challenge people to verify. Go back in my history. Don't listen to what I told you. Look at what I did. Go back five, six, seven, eight years right. and see the 
that was talking back oh, then. I was, I was my present for some of them conversations. I remember. Right. <laughs> that, that, that. <laughs> you was present in those conversations. Yeah, because what I, I was present. <laughs> again, you was present. And, 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 and those are opportunities that a lot of people would rather avoid. I embrace them. When somebody challenged me, critiqued me or whatever, I embrace it because I know that what I'm doing, you may not agree with it, but I am doing it with good intentions. Um, and listen, I, I would rather have the guy that challenged me than a guy that sat behind me and agreed with me. And then when I left, talked about me. Right. And I always say, you don't need cheerleaders. You need supporters. Cheerleaders are going to agree with everything. Supporters are going to have them tough conversations. Say, hey, dude, you need to tone it down because I think that you might be taking this on the wrong direction. Like we yeah. talked earlier to that. Don't drift. You know, sometimes, okay. you, you know, we, sometimes you need somebody there to pull your coattail. And if you're around me and I consider you a friend, I'm going to pull your coattail. And I want and you I appreciate to it, do the same, I appreciate the same it. with me. You know, I'm going to pull your and coattail. It ain't about agreeing. You said that, Jim, and I can, I can tell you this. There's a guy named Wilkie Wolf who's on, who is in prison today. I don't think Wilkie get out till 2027. He's there for murder. Uh, or actually, uh, uh, they didn't call it that. They called it something else. But anyway, Wilkes is a good guy, but that's his third violent crime. He was my handler for years. But now one of the things that made me a good feeder is he questioned everything I did. There was a lot of times we went to the derbies and showed up with black eyes because we pulled over <laughs> on the way there and fight. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> he questioned everything I did. But he would not right. be satisfied with the answer, well, because it worked last time. No, right. why did you do it? Why did you right. do that? You know, and it's uh, and and he made me a better feeder. It's a little tough getting there. The learning curve was sharp, but <laughs> he made me a better feeder. That's, no right. Right. that's right. That's right. That's it. That's exactly right, man. And I think, like I say, you know, um, you, you know, my whole thing is is we got to create the next generation. We can't allow society that's just right. to create them. We have to actively create the next generation by setting a bunch of setting those standards, but also practicing what we're preaching. Because, you know, a lot of times we so quick to tell somebody else something or try to hold somebody accountable. But then when we get held accountable, we catch an attitude. Ooh, we don't about like it. that. We don't like that. Oh, we'd be like a wet setting in. We don't like that. But talking <laughs> about that, talking about that, let's discuss the program that you put in place to do that very thing. And that's that 362 program. The greatest program that's ever come to cop fight, as far as all, all the gang foul, as far as I'm concerned, excuse me. But it is the greatest program ever come to gang foul. Yeah. Now, yeah. it's uh, uh, Jeremy Daniels, my, my so-called student. He wasn't my student. He was my partner uh, in, in, the, in the Team 362 thing. Jeremy's one of my closest friends to this day. Uh, me and Jerry talk at least three times a week, every week. And the majority of our conversation isn't about chickens. I mean, we're going to talk about chickens sometime during the conversation, but we talk a lot about life. I'm having a problem. He's having a problem. Can he help me? Can I help him? That would not have been possible without your program. I met a good lifelong friend because of your program, and I'm beholden to that. And look, we look. I'm gonna have a look. If I ever get a tattoo, it's gonna say "Team of Loving," and I stand up and show you loving, but I'd have to pull my pants down because I ain't got my ten fingers. But Team of Loving, <laughs> Team of Loving forever, baby. You know what I'm saying? And now Jeremy is teaching somebody. You know what I mean? So, so that's that's man, that's great. And look, Jeremy's got a picture. I call him Rooster Mafia. He looks. If y'all know Jeremy Daniels, see him on Facebook. He's Rooster Mafia. That's what he is. That's <laughs> I see, I see that picture. Yeah, I think he might, uh, but he actually probably he look a little bit more like the the rooster Amish mafia. Yeah, yeah. yeah he might be the one to come get us. I don't know. He might he might be in there. He might be in there with him. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you better be worried over there. I didn't believe me. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, look, Don, I, that's I don't, exactly I don't, need, right. I don't even want to know what Amish jail look like. I'm really scared of what yeah, Amish I, jail might be. I'm already on the edge of a Well, you know what? You know, Don, that, that's the thing, man. With that, you know, again, I, I have dealt with a lot of resistance coming in. And, and obviously, you know, because I don't, I wasn't born and raised in a game foul. And, you know, I don't have the background and that kind of stuff in the American cockers and that kind of stuff. So I you, obviously, you know, I dealt with a lot, a lot of resistance coming into it. 
But you know, well, I, I just try to no, 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 no. You have you have overcome all that because the last place I went, even though all my years were game pile, you know what they stopped me and told me, "Oh, you're Jim what? Collins' friend. You're Jim Collins' friend." I said, "Oh, yeah." So now. <laughs> I, I ain't Don Lester. I ain't the regular woman. I'm Jim Collins' friend. <laughs> He's very well known at that now. Yeah, I'm just Jim Collins' friend, which is okay. Hey, I'm okay did, with it. Hey, what, what did Jeff say back there? Oh, I don't know. What did you have to say, Jeff? Mr. Lester is very well known now as Jim Collins' friend. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> My name's unimportant. My name's unimportant. <laughs> you see people, hey, hey. Are you Jim Collins' friend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be me. <laughs> hey, well, you know what? Let me tell you, Don. It, it's been it's been a journey for me, man. It's been a journey, and I'll be lying to you if I told you it was easy. It's it, it's been tough. It's been hard, and um, you know, well, I, I can, a lot of messages. I can, a lot of time. I can remember when you sent me this emblem and asked me That's what right. I thought of it. And that's been a long time ago, Jim. We, we've been and look, me and you gonna go, me and you gonna go down some more roads together. There are things that you are doing right now that we can't talk about that you've talked to me about right. that's going to stay on the game power world. Right. And it's uh, that, I'm I'm just telling I'm telling everybody right. up there, you need to look up to this man right here. He has our best interest at heart. Amen. And, 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 you know, I, I really, really appreciate that, man. And I tell you, man, they, they always say, you know, the man leading the pack a lot of times is always a lonely road travel. But, you know, I always say and I get a lot of messages from a lot of people and uh, I meet a lot of people in my travel and never paid attention a lot of times to how many people are, got their eyes on me. But, you know, I hear a lot of people say, man, you know what, dude, I've been watching you. I'm really inspired by you. And I always tell him, I say, listen, he's like, man, I don't see how you do it. I don't see how you got the patience to deal with all these different people. I say, dude, one of the things is, and I don't know if I even got the right answer to that question. But one thing I do know, and all I'm doing is traveling that journey to reach that destination of that purpose. I, you know, I might piss people off on the way there. I'll make some great friends on the way there. But at the end of the day, it had gotten to a point where I was just so sick and tired of people just questioning my intent, who I was, where I came from. But I'm glad now. Last year, 2019 was the last of that because I always dealt with those same encounters. And you know, because you was present right. sometimes, I right. never tried away from it. Oh no! Oh no! You would, you face. would move me over to get to him. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> What's your? And, and, and Jim, but, but look, back, Jim, look hey, Jim, Jim, you were so. And here's the thing: I can go sit down with a senator. It's not going to have the same influence if you sit down with you. You're much better prepared for that. And so you're. And, and I think that's why God's got you where you are. And got you in the position you're in. I really think you were sent here to lead us because we obviously can't lead ourselves. We fight too much to to, to do it. And and uh, I just got great respect for you. And like I say, I know your character. It's one thing to talk about integrity. It's another thing to express it and to live it and to walk it. And because I know the road that you walk and what you do, and that's why you're always in my prayers. And it's uh, and why I always, man, I, I mean, I'm telling you, like I said before, somebody could tell me Jim Collins said this, and I said, "Oh no, that ain't Jim didn't do that." You know what I mean? Because I know you that well. well I, t I tell you what, man. On this journey, I do a lot of praying. I do a lot yeah. of praying because the times are tough. It's a lot of stuff that people don't see that I have to deal with. There's a lot of people I have to deal with. There's a lot of situation that I have to deal with. And the thing is, is it's not all about me. You know, one guy told me, hey, Jim, why don't we have an interview about, about you? And I'm like, dude, none of this is about me. None of this is about me. You know, it's well, all about – well, that that ain't a bad idea for for have that whole three sixty two first class, and for all of us to tell to to have a show about what you mean to us. That would be a good you know, idea. I, well, I appreciate that. We going to have we going to have some of the teams on, like you and Jeremy's going to be on. We going to have some of the teams on, and I think oh, you know oh, that. that other, wait a minute, wait a minute. That, there's other teams. I didn't know there oh, was yeah. no other teams. <laughs> What, what, why? Why you know you? T how do you think you came up with Team Eleven? How about Team yeah. Ten and Team Twelve and Team Team Three? Oh, I didn't. You know, I just thought we was it. 
So I know we really is it. Who up in my Rick Barbarian and all them man? Ain't like a Rick Rick don't Rick gonna cut my hair and cut a nine in it or something. <laughs> No, hey, man, all, the guys, all the guys at Gators that we met down at Gators, I mean, all those guys still message me now. I wouldn't have met any of those guys, man. That was such a good time. And let me a shout out to Gator for that. And I can't wait till next year. Uh, but it's, yeah. uh, I mean, it's, it's, I met such good people, man. It's just, it's been amazing to me. Um, this, the way I feel about this sport is much more positive than it's ever been because of what you've done. I try my best, brother. I'm just trying to do whatever little part I can to make a difference. And they always said, I think it was Winston Churchill said, once you take the need to take credit for something out of it, you can get a whole lot of stuff done. That's and I fact. truly believe, That's it. you know, once once you take the need out, having to take credit for something or have to show everybody on Facebook what you're doing and have to tell everybody what you're doing. Once you take that out, you can get a whole lot of stuff done. That's 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 just like Jim. And I, and I feel that way. I challenge anybody anywhere to find one picture of me standing holding a truck. There's not. There's not any. I won't do it. I won't lie. Because you know what? That one's in the past. What's it matter? Next one's what I'm into. Right. So it's a That's plus. Right. I, ain't, I ain't never able to buy groceries with a truck. You know what I mean? I'm, <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> I got to go get some food, man. <laughs> Well, I tell you, Don, man, it's been, you know, I, I've been, I, I have a lot going on. We got another class that's coming up, but my ultimate goal is, you know, with that program and like that symbol you wearing on your head, it all started from a humble beginning that a lot of people don't know the history of. Um, and, 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 you know, and people never, people are not, too many people are not interested in knowing the history of anything. Only thing people want to see is the end result. Nobody really wants to hear about the journey. And, uh, and that's the, the reason why I'm kind of. That's that's what I wanted to tell you. You're talking about the journey and how look, the end ain't it. Look, the, right. the show ain't it. Winning the trophy ain't it. It's getting that's there. Right. That's 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 the best part of it. Uh I, you, you can ask Jeff. When we leave a show, we ain't back down the driveway, I'm asleep. I don't care where I go. Cause I right. finally let my mind rest. You know what I mean? When good or bad, good or bad, you know, I'm asleep. Because I finally let my mind rest. Because till then, that journey means everything to me. It's, uh, and then it's time to start another one. You know, rest the day, start another one. But the journey you're on, man, it, it, enjoy that journey. Because I know, and I know it's tough. And I know it's mean you've had some talks where you've told me about some tough times. But there's going to be some good times, too. And the end result will be worth it. But you enjoy that journey, brother. Yeah, and that, that's what I'm trying to do, man. You know, I did kind of switch up my approach a little bit for 2020, you know, because, again, I was dropping, setting a lot of stuff on the wayside that I shouldn't have, but it was all worth it. I have no regrets, and we're going to keep on pushing forward. And and I just hope that more people, because Journey to the Pit 362 is not about Jim Collins. It's an idea. It's a movement. It's Amen. about everybody. You know what I mean? It's about everybody. It's not about it's just a, Jim Collins. It's about the um, whole fraternity. Just, it's about the whole fraternity. And that's uh that's exactly and, right. And, and saying that, Jim, let's say this. Uh our our country, and one of the reasons you're doing this right now is our country's in a in, in whether we agree with it or not, whether we think it's as dangerous as it is, our country's in a state of emergency right now. And let's uh let's honor our president, let's do what he asks. Game right. file or not as important as what's going on right now. So let's let's make sure everybody's safe. We lost too many good cockers this year. We lost legends that, that took a lot of their knowledge with them that, that we'll never replace. Let's don't take a chance on giving those older guys because we could be a carrier, you know. Let's don't, let's don't take a chance on, on, on some of our older cockers. We go to a meet somewhere because we just got to be there. And all of a sudden, we're a carrier and we go to our friend's house, our mentor, and now you're going to give your mentor something that kills him. How you live with that? That's right. uh, That's let's right. let's don't do that. Let's be respectful That's of right. other people and respectful of our fraternity. Stay home. That's right. Just stay home. That's right. That's exactly right. 
That that's that's exactly I agree with you one thousand percent because if you've been in this game a long time, you already know it's another year. If you haven't been in this game a long time, you know you got many more years. So I can tell you right now, anybody well again, I'm gonna hold my opinions to myself, but I just know I try to leave. <laughs> Easy you know, trigger, easy. Like <laughs> you know, I just I just try to lead by example, man. But I hope, I hope more game foul breeders buy into the concept and understand the concept of the journey to the pit 362 and understand we need to start highlighting the stuff that's not sexy. We need to start highlighting the backbone of this sport, which is the dedication, the patience, the sacrifice, the hard work. That's not the sexy stuff. It doesn't shine. It doesn't get a lot of likes on Facebook, doesn't get a lot of comments on Facebook. But at the end of the day, that's the standard that we have to live so we can create the other generation. Because again, they don't learn about what we tell them. They learn about what we do. And that's, that's why right. I'm a stickler on the fact that I live, you know, I'm, I'm just going to practice what I preach. And if you don't believe it, I challenge you. Go back through my Facebook history. See what I talked about years ago. See what I'm talking today. I'm practicing what I'm preaching and hoping that inspire people. I'm not just telling it or saying it. I'm doing it. And that's why the Journey to the Pit program is extremely important because it gives us an opportunity to give back, set those standards, and make up, be a part of creating that next generation. That's the way I look at it. It's, uh, I would like to say, Jim, I give a shout out to it. There's a gentleman that is running for Senate. His name's Derek Petty's. In the at the at, at, here in Kentucky, he's running on the Reform Party, which is actually a new party, um, and he supports the rights of farmers and ranchers everywhere. He supports the right for us to be able to do with what we want to do with, but what we raise um, to be able to harvest our product however we choose. Um, and he is a, and and he has been very very informative, and uh, uh, I, I really got a lot of respect for the man. So if you get a chance, he's got to have a lot of signatures. And when they get some signatures together, they've expanded it to June. He just wants to get okay. on the ballot. You know what I mean? So we okay. need to try to get Derek Petty's on the ballot here in Kentucky. Okay. So, so Don, what you can also do too, you know, later on after the interview, if you can, if you can, um, you know, uh, post his information down in the comment section so everybody can have, you know, kind of, kind of have access to it okay. or, or at least they can look up and go to his page and then, you know, sign what they need to sign on that page. That'd be a great opportunity, at least for him, that we can kind of do something to help him out. Um, okay. and again, we don't what's going to work, what's not going to work, but at least we can try to just do our part. So, uh, please right. don't well, forget. Well, we have got to have people in those positions. I mean, listen, that's that's how we lost, is we didn't have people yep. in those positions. So yep. now we, look, the Humane Society has given us a great uh, 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 a great path right. of how to do things. A so we just got to use what they give. We got to use what they right. give us. Exactly. They wrote the blueprint. I don't know why so people are not understanding. The method is tried, true, and proven. Try true and proven. And, and guys talk to me and say, well, it's all about money. It's all about money. I debunked that story back then. That story was debunked 30 years ago because I can tell you back then, 30 years ago, when it was legal, you know, you had you had gatherings throughout this whole country every weekend, probably five, six hundred, a thousand of them. Oh, you everywhere. Know, everywhere. You know, the monetary that was being transferred back then. It's never oh, been man. a lack of funding. It's the fact of the matter is people don't see the importance of putting funding in certain areas. That's all it is. Ain't never been a lack of money. They don't have more money than we do because game file industry is a billion dollar industry. Right. A billion. Right. And see, we've and got to, we, we've got to, just like I'm trying to understand, and that's one reason I, I'm here with James, <laughs> is James is really educated in the science of all this. In the science right. of game file, the science of what we do, and that just like I'm trying to understand the science to make me a better feeder, we've got to understand as a fraternity the science behind how to how to how to get back on top. We've got to understand that. We've got to apply that. But what we did ain't working. Didn't work. Right. So we got to do right. something different. We can't do what we kept doing. We got a lot of losses on the board. So we got to put some W's up there. Well, it's going to take something different. They showed us how to do it. We need to use their keep. We need to use their keep. Their keep worked. That's so that's, that's exactly how yep, we got to do it. Exactly right. 
That's exactly right. Well, listen, man, we have had some great, we at the two hour mark now, which I know is going to be two hours and this won't be the last conversation because again, we're going to have that, uh, and, and, and all the viewers out there, a couple of things before we close, I want to talk about, we are going to be doing a live stream, um, from, from the house with Don, uh, Jeff Chapman and, uh, James Barnes. We're going to do, they, these guys get up every morning. They kind of sit at the breakfast table in the morning and they have some discussions and we're going to do a little live stream, um, boys, from their boys, house. Boys, we're going to have to keep that in G rating now. Y'all can't talk oh. like y'all normally do. Oh, y'all going to have to keep that conversation G rated. This <laughs> Now we're going to have rules? Yeah, we got rules, Jeff, rules. We've got to have some kind of rules, but – but uh, but at the end of the day, man, we're gonna have that convers. You know, we're gonna have that conversation. I think that'd be a great opportunity too for guys to you know ask some additional questions, kind of see how y'all guys just brainstorm first thing in the morning. Um, you know, a lot of guys would like to be the fly on the wall, but we ain't gonna be the fly on the wall. We're gonna be the phone on the table. So uh, there you go. so that's there what you go. On that's right. So listen, guys, before we close this thing out, a couple more, a couple things I want to talk about. Tomorrow we're gonna take off. Uh, we're not going to have an interview tomorrow, you know, talk to a couple people and, you know, we don't want to do the interview on Sunday. Um, you know, that's that's an opportunity for a lot of people to spend time with their family, you know, go to worship and stuff like that. So we're not going to do an interview tomorrow. Uh, but what I will do tomorrow is I will post a schedule of when we will be having the rest of the interviews. So I'll post the, the person, the, the guest, and the date that we'll be interviewing. And all the interviews at this time will be at 9 p.m., at night, 9 p.m. at night, right. um, that kind of works because we're going to be interviewing people in, 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 in different countries like Hawaii, you know, uh, uh, Philippines and stuff like that. So 9 p.m. kind of works for everybody across the board. So Jim, tomorrow. Before, before, before we go, and go ahead and close out, but before we go, let's do a word of prayer before we cut this thing off, okay? Okay, one more thing. So let me just finish this and then we can have that word right, of ahead. prayer. So tomorrow I'm going to post a list of all the special guests and the days that we will be interviewing them. And just remember, all the interviews will be on this page, Journey to the Pit page, because it allows everybody to comment without having to be on a friends list. So you'll have that out. We're not going to interview tomorrow. We'll start back again on Monday, 9 p.m. I'll post the schedule up tomorrow, and I look forward to seeing y'all guys for the rest of the week. Don, you can go ahead and close this thing out with a word of prayer. Right. If everybody would just bow their heads and just listen. I, I would like to say first that I've seen the lineup, and I'm the least guy on the crowd, so y'all need to be paying attention. Them boys got some important stuff. <laughs> Heavenly Father, That's Lord, right. thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to share with friends. Thank you for the opportunity we have for fellowship. I thank you for Jim, and I thank you for the blessings that you bestowed on him and the favor that you've given him to lead us. And, Lord, I pray that we follow him. And that uh, he lead us into greener pastures because we need them. Lord, protect us from this coronavirus. Lord, perhaps you had all this happen so that families would spend more time together, that we would gather at the dinner table, that we would find peace with each other, that we could find peace with nature, that we would quit being so rushed and we could slow down. Help us to enjoy ourselves and enjoy this journey. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Hey, man, brother, I will see all I will talk to all y'all guys soon. We're going to close this out. This has been a, a wonderful, wonderful experience, brother. This has been a second time. Guys, no, I will be uploading this video to YouTube and then I'll also be uploading the audio to the podcast Journey to the Pit 362 podcast. And then you can go on over to Journey to the Pit 362 YouTube channel to see the second interview. I have all the interviews up there, but just know, watch out, follow tomorrow, post the schedule for the rest of the interviews tomorrow. We'll start this thing back on Monday. God bless you. God bless Jeff. God bless James Barnes, little JJ, and God bless all y'all viewers. I will Amen. talk to all y'all guys soon. I hope y'all guys enjoy. Y'all have a good evening. I'll all talk right, to y'all guys soon. All right, all right. Have a good day. All right. All right.